Richard Nixon made me fail a spelling bee. There, I said it. Much to your shock, I'm sure, I will tell you how, but I only have fifteen minutes to do it, so I'm going to have to talk very quickly. It all started for me in the year 1972. Richard Nixon was President of the United States, and he was running for re-election. He wanted to make sure that 1972 would be a landslide. Of course, there were numerous problems, as there always are in a presidency, but the biggest one was probably Vietnam, a war which Nixon had inherited from Lyndon Johnson. Aside from the problem of people dying and billions and billions of dollars going overseas to a very unpopular war, there was a very specific problem in the person of Daniel Ellsberg. Ellsberg had previously been with the Department of Defense, and now worked for the Rand Corporation, a think tank. Johnson's Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, had sent a number of highly sensitive documents over to the Rand Corporation, hoping for an analysis of the Pentagon's prosecution of the war. Ellsberg, who had been somewhat hawkish before, changed his mind completely after seeing the papers, and now found the war unwinnable and immoral. He therefore leaked all of these papers to the New York Times, which the Times printed as the Pentagon Papers. Nixon, who was now president, was understandably furious. And this was not the only example of leaks in Nixon's administration. There were leaks from the White House and from the Pentagon, and everyone he talked to expressed concern. But still, no one could figure out who was leaking all of this information. Nixon, however, was confident in his top aides, a very tight circle of advisors that included Chief of Staff H.R. Haldeman, John Ehrlichman, Attorney General John Mitchell, and a young lawyer by the name of John Dean. Indeed, Haldeman and Ehrlichman were nicknamed behind their backs the Berlin Wall because they insulated the president so well, and also because of their German names. Amongst the president's advisors, the topic of leaks came up, and it was decided, without, it seems, the knowledge of President Nixon, that a secret organization be set up that would fix those leaks, and it would be called the Plumbers. Get it? It would be involved in numerous activities to make sure that the 1972 election went the way Nixon wanted it. One of their first missions was extremely bizarre. The plumbers were to break into the office of Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist to see if they could find anything incriminating about his state of mind. And things were to get bigger, more bizarre, and more out of control. Now, there was no question about Nixon being renominated, but among the Democrats, several candidates seemed promising. The two most promising were Edmund Muskie and George McGovern. The Republicans were determined to trounce either one of them, but since Muskie had more popular support, it was agreed that they would find a way to run against McGovern, who could be trounced more easily. Anyway, back on the up and up, the Republicans had set up the Committee to Re-elect the President, a fundraising organization abbreviated by people who didn't like Nixon as CREEP, but officially abbreviated as the CRP. So people who gave money to Nixon gave money to the CRP. Now, back behind closed doors. The plumbers, working under Nixon's men, and not really under Nixon himself except indirectly, consisted of people like Howard Hunt and G. Gordon Liddy. G. Gordon Liddy was the kind of person who, at a party, would hold his hand directly into a candle flame just to show people he didn't mind the pain, which is a little disturbing. Liddy was an idea man, and he came up with numerous suggestions to destroy Nixon's enemies and drive the Democratic Party into shambles. One of the ideas was to burglarize the Watergate complex. The Watergate complex was a huge collection of buildings that included offices, a hotel, apartments, a dry cleaner, a bakery, haberdashery, a bowling alley, an armor repair center, and a museum of paleontology. The idea was to break into Democratic National Committee headquarters, located at the Watergate, and also the office of its chairman, Larry O'Brien, and attach bugs to the telephones so that the plumbers could listen to conversations to find out if there was anything going on that they could use. The people recruited to actually carry out the burglary included James McCord, who had previously been with the CIA, and a man named Bernard Barker, who stated his profession as anti-communist. But the burglary was thwarted by none other than the D.C. police, who caught the five burglars red-handed after a call from a security guard at the Watergate. The burglars were arraigned, but the legal system worked a little differently in the District of Columbia than it did in some other places. In order to prevent the prosecutor from having too much power, there was a system of a grand jury. 
In a grand jury, there are 23 normal citizens who hear evidence and decide whether or not to pass down indictments. And so a grand jury began hearing evidence. Meanwhile, soon after the break-in, the FBI started investigating. It was domestic espionage, after all. And Nixon was just enough out of the loop so he didn't know about the burglary, but it was suggested to him that he tell the CIA to tell the FBI to stop investigating because it was a national security risk, which, of course, it wasn't. At the same time, the Democratic presidential candidate was now George McGovern. Former frontrunner Edwin Muskie's campaign had self-destructed, or, as it was later revealed, was destroyed largely through the efforts of people associated with the White House. And then McGovern gave the Republicans a gift. In the days before the internet, round-the-clock TV news services, or even before anyone had a VCR, George McGovern decided to give his acceptance speech at two o'clock in the morning. No one saw it. It turned out to be a prelude of things to come. By the time November rolled around, McGovern was trounced. In the election, he carried Massachusetts and the District of Columbia, and ended up with a whopping 3% of the electoral vote. Well, the Watergate break-in had happened several months before now, and it still wasn't a huge story on the national front, but it was growing. Indictments were handed down from the grand jury, and indicted were the five Watergate burglars, Howard Hunt and G. Gordon Liddy. Of course, there were lingering questions about why they had done what they did, and where they got the money, and many other questions. On March 23, 1973, Nixon again took a more active role. The White House, of course, had to deny that it knew anything about the burglary, but unfortunately, people who have done illegal things, and then get cut off by the people who told them to do those illegal things, have a habit of getting very irritated. Plus, they were in jail, and not working, and they had to pay legal fees. So they became more and more upset. On March 23rd, John Dean approached the president and told him that the burglars might need a lot of money to keep them quiet. Nixon asked, how much do you think they'll need? John Dean just pulled a figure out of the air and said, perhaps one million dollars, which was a lot of money back then. Nixon said, it can be gotten, which is not exactly what you want the president to say in a perfect world. At about the same time, James W. McCord, one of the burglars, sent a letter to the judge at the grand jury saying that his testimony had been perjured and that the perjury was supervised by none other than Attorney General John Mitchell whose job description did not include suborning perjury. So the grand jury was reopened, and there was witness after witness after witness after witness. Although all grand jury testimony was secret, there was growing attention about what all this actually meant. It was becoming a national story. And at some point during all this, the Watergate affair, meaning the incident that took place at the Watergate office complex, became simply Watergate. The Senate now took an active role, and established the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities, chaired by the very formidable Sam Irvin. Its televised hearings introduced viewers to people they had perhaps only read about in newspapers, people like Mitchell, Haldeman, Ehrlichman, and Dean. Though it was extremely difficult to sift through all the information, especially since no one had all the information, it was nevertheless very exciting TV, and not too many people watching seemed to mind that it was cutting into their soap opera time. There were shocking and arrogant statements from the president's men who had been called in to testify, including that the burglary of Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office had been performed in the interest of national security, which infuriated Sam Irvin, which you really didn't want to do. Well, John Dean, who had sort of been placed in the position of orchestrating the Watergate cover-up, now felt he was about to be betrayed by Nixon. Nixon asked him to write up a report about everything that was happening in Watergate, Supposedly so that he, the president, who actually was not a part of every decision, would know exactly what was going on. The report would have John Dean's name on it. Dean then got a queasy feeling in his gizzard and felt that everything was about to be pinned on him. And so, when it was his turn to speak before the Senate committee, Dean spoke in great detail about every single thing that happened, about his participation, Haldeman's, Ehrlichman's, Mitchell's, and even the president's. He didn't say that the president was responsible for the break in or for any of the activities of the plumbers and others, but he did say that the president was instrumental in helping cover up the crimes. So now the White House was being investigated by different groups, the grand jury, the Senate, the FBI, but its investigation was curtailed by the CIA, you remember, and there were at least two more. The Washington Post had been on the story since the very beginning, 
and its two later to become star reporters, Carl Bernstein and Bob Woodward, had done an enormous amount of legwork, and what was printed in the Washington Post was eventually reprinted in numerous other newspapers across the country, which, of course, couldn't help but get the attention of the grand jury and Senate investigations. Woodward and Bernstein got assistance from a mysterious contact that Woodward would meet in an underground garage. His identity was kept secret, and he was referred to by the Washington Post as Deep Throat. Also, there was a special prosecutor that Nixon himself had been obligated to appoint. This special prosecutor, named Archibald Cox, worked under the Attorney General, no longer John Mitchell. John Mitchell had left the Attorney General's office to become director of the aforementioned, and about to be mentioned again, Committee to Re-elect the President. The special prosecutor would be given sweeping powers of investigation, and publicly Nixon was all for it because he wanted to show that he was the kind of guy who wanted to bring all wrongdoers to justice. Anyway, what all of this was getting at was that the contributions to the Committee to Re-elect the President were being used to finance covert operations by the plumbers and others. So, if you contributed to Nixon's campaign, you could indirectly be contributing to all of this, as well as potentially to hush money to keep all of the people quiet after the scandal blew up. As shocking as all of this was, it was still sort of a he said, she said type of thing. Did you believe Nixon, who denied everything, or did you believe the Washington Post? Then came very brief testimony from a man named Alexander Butterfield. Butterfield, a White House aide, revealed something which, at the time, was absolutely unthinkable, namely that all of the conversations that Nixon had with his men, with Haldeman, Ehrlichman, Dean, Mitchell, and others, all of them had been tape-recorded, and that the tapes still existed. Now things got terribly exciting. With that revelation, the Senate wanted the tapes, Judge Sirica of the Grand Jury wanted the tapes, Archibald Cox wanted the tapes, everyone wanted the tapes. Nixon, of course, didn't want to give them up. Well, Nixon couldn't get rid of the grand jury, and he couldn't dismantle the Senate, so he tried at least to get rid of Archibald Cox. But he couldn't fire Cox himself, so he went to the new attorney general and told him to fire Cox. The attorney general refused and resigned. The deputy attorney general also said he couldn't do it and was fired. The next man in line was Robert Bork, and he determined that in his opinion as the acting attorney general, it was in fact legal to follow the president's order and fire Cox. Within hours, not only was Cox gone, but Cox's physical office was completely sealed off, almost as if it had never existed. Now, the reporters had seen a lot of shocking things over the last couple of years, but this left even them flabbergasted. They referred to it as the Saturday Night Massacre. Nixon was forced to reestablish the position of special prosecutor, but this time the appointee was Leon Jaworski. Now, Jaworski wanted the tapes, too. Nixon then hit upon the idea of releasing transcripts of the tapes, an idea which he put forth to the American people on national television. This stall worked for a while, but only for a while. Nixon and Jaworski eventually took their case to the Supreme Court, here we are, the third branch of government, and in the decision, the United States versus Nixon, it was stated that Nixon had to give all relevant tapes over to the investigators. When the tapes were played, they revealed in no uncertain terms the corruption of the Nixon administration. They also revealed that John Dean, in his testimony, demonstrated an almost perfect memory. Well, you probably know the rest. The pressure against Nixon grew and grew, support dwindled, even among his staunchest supporters, and the House of Representatives was about to recommend impeachment proceedings. But on August 9, 1974, Nixon resigned the presidency. Many of his aides, even his top aides, went to prison. Nixon, however, was given a full pardon by Gerald Ford a month later, Ford not wanting to spend his administration analyzing the problems of the previous administration. Oh, and incidentally, it was revealed years later that the Washington Post's garage freak was the number two man at the FBI, Mark W. Felt. And because of all this, and because my mother was home much of the time, and because I was home much of the time in the summer, and because she was watching the Watergate hearings, I missed a lot of the electric company, which I really needed, so I could, among other things, learn to differentiate hard C from soft C. So, in a spelling bee, much later in life, when the word thoracic came up, there was absolutely no way I could have predicted that there were two C's in that word. And I lost. Thanks a lot, Tricky. <laughs>